Thanks. Shaping the intelligence created by I.J. Good to refer to the idea that intelligence is the source. If we get to the point where technology can be used to significantly improve the intelligence of the technology designers, we can get smarter leads to smarter. And the eventual result of that is something that leaves the human scale far behind. And I'm going to be talking about possibilities for shaping the intelligence explosion. The question of whether there's stuff we can do now. So I'm going to be walking you through four key claims. Claim one, intelligence can radically transform the world. Claim two, an intelligence explosion may be sudden. Claim three, an uncontrolled intelligence explosion would kill us and destroy practically everything we care about. And claim four, a controlled explosion, if we manage that, could save us and protect practically everything else we wish to save. It's difficult, but worth the attempt. So before I get into the meat, I want to talk a little bit about methodology, about what we do and don't know today about AI, and about how we arrived at these four claims. So obviously, the unknowns in these sorts of scenarios for now are vast. Um, and perhaps the biggest unknown is the type of artificial intelligence we might eventually create. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, if you think about that, we're actually think, talking about any kind of intelligence that isn't human, but is at least as powerful as humans. And so I'm stealing this image from Elias Dukowski, because I think he says it, he puts it unusually vividly. But we have this sort of vast space here of possible minds or machines, right? And when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're talking about anything in that whole space except that little dot, the human mind's dot, that has an X through it. So there is no one goal that artificial intelligences would have, and there's no one architect initial architecture by which artificial intelligences could think. Talking about artificial intelligences, or intelli minds that aren't human, is like talking about animals that aren't starfish, or foods that aren't pineapple. Second big unknown, the external circumstances in which AI might eventually be created. So this is the year that, we don't know the year that AI would be created, assuming science keeps chugging along long enough to make it. We don't know the type of people who would make AI or the kinds of precautions they would or would not take. We don't know if AI would be arriving in an economy that already had uh, strong special purpose artificial intelligences or if it would be sort of arriving as a shock. Um, Oops. Sorry. And because of that, you might ask if, um, you might wonder if we can say anything at all given these vast unknowns. And it turns out that we can't. So imagine, by way of analogy, imagine rerunning the tape of life from halfway back. There'd be all kinds of things we didn't know, all kinds of ways that life's possibilities could branch out and explore. But there would be other things, sort of convergent features, that would be reasonable bets across a broad range of possible scenarios such as eyes, which were partially reinvented many times in the history of Earth. Or energy storage mechanisms, things like sugars, batteries, and oil. Or digitality, which is used in DNA, in writing, in computer memory, each time because it enables efficient, high accuracy um, replication. Money, computation, mathematics. So convergent features that systems, that a variety of different systems use because their use because they serve a particular purpose in a wide range of contexts. And note that if a given feature really is the best way to accomplish something, then the smarter the intelligence, the more reliably it will choose that feature. So I'll be focusing on mechanisms that seem about this general. I won't be telling a specific story about what exactly will happen. And I won't be relying on Moore's law, an accelerating change model, or any other specific technological trajectory. Even though thinking about such trajectories can be useful, and even though I'm very glad we'll be hearing about them from other speakers. But my focus this morning will be on some general mechanisms that form good bets across a wide range of AI scenarios. Also, I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of it, and so I'm going to be working mainly with concrete examples and metaphors because it's the fastest way to get hold of a new subject. 
Um, but the claims I'll be presenting were arrived at by analysis, even though I don't have time to present that analysis here. And even though I'm going to be losing some caveats here for the sake of brevity. So if you want to know why we think something, send me an email or catch me after the talk. So claim one, intelligence can radically transform the world. So think here of Archimedes. Build something with enough intelligence, and almost always, it will move the world. Um, sorry. Intelligence is like leverage. An intelligent being might start out with only a bit of physical power. But if it's smart enough to find novel, efficient ways of accomplishing its goals, it can use that small starting power to create big change. So to start seeing how intelligence creates change, look around, right? Human, we humans changed up the world quite a bit, and we changed it up quite a bit more than most species. And the reason we ended up making these changes is that human individuals have goals, and we're smart enough to find rearrangements of the world that better fulfill our goals. So the smarter humans have gotten, and the more knowledge we've gained as a species, the more such rearrangements we've found. And the deeper into the organization of matter our rearrangements have gone. So we started out with chipped stone tools and deer skins, um, items that were just slightly changed from their natural state. And we made our way gradually to the plastics, laptop computers, and Starbucks lattes that you see around you today. And note that the mechanism here that's driving humans to create change holds for nearly all intelligences with goals. We're not using human-specific features here. So the idea is just that most goals are not maximally satisfied by the particular state that things around you happen to be in. And the smarter a given agent is, the better it will be able to both a, determine arrangements that will better suit its goals, and then B, find routes to access those arrangements. So before I talk about what intelligences in general will do, I want to take a brief segue to talk about the scale of possible intelligences and where humans fit in. So imagine trying to teach your cat quantum mechanics, to steal Chris Wood's metaphor. Or to steal Werner Vinge's metaphor, imagine a goldfish at the opera. There are minds that just can't access particular domains. Um, which invites the question, right, what's beyond human minds? Um, so I have here a theoretical toy from computer science, invented actually by Marcus Hutter, um, who's going to be speaking this afternoon to us. Um, and what AIXI is, is so it's a, mathematic, it's a theoretical toy, it's a mathematical idea that can be described fully and precisely, but would require an infinite computer to really run. Um, but it, what it does is it gives us a model of what fully intelligent might mean, of sort of how much juice you could in principle squeeze from the data. And the basic idea, this is a bit of a simplification, but the basic idea is just it has all the possible patterns, right? You can see them on the left. Um, all the possible ways that different data could be correlated. It bangs all of its patterns against all of its data set, figures out which ones are consistent with the data, and then uses all of the consistent patterns to predict things. Um, and so AIXI can, for example, and you can actually work this out, AIXI can, for example, look at a video clip of this auditorium and deduce our laws of physics with high probability from the way objects are colored and standing and leaning. It can deduce that you're made of proteins, and as it watches your face, it can get a probability distribution as to your evolutionary history, your social relationships, your inmost fears. And the reason why intelligence can, in principle, do this um, is that the diff different parts of the universe are correlated with one another. They're related to one another by simple rules, simple patterns unfolding through time. Human scientists and human detectives make use of some of these correlations. But AIXI exploits all the findable correlations, all at once. When it tries to figure out what action will best hit its goals, it uses all the correlations that scientists know today, and all the ones that scientists don't know today, but might someday come up with, and all of the ones that we'll never come up with, because they're too big to fit in our human heads, all of them all at once. That's what an actually powerful super intelligence might be able to do. Um, and if you think about it, you can see that the distance between cats and humans, say, is smaller than the distance from humans to AIXI in terms of what data sets we could make useful inferences from. Okay, so, some, so humans can follow out any computer program. 
Um, and folks sometimes argue that this means we can emulate anything that any other intelligence can do. When they say that, they skip the timing issue. I can follow an algorithm out for calculating cube roots, but my $10 pocket calculator can do it literally a thousand times faster, right? Um, and if it would take us literal eons to emulate by hand one second from a particular intelligence, and if for the moment we live less than a century, well, that emulation isn't very useful. It's not emulation in a very useful sense. Intelligence and goal achievement are about responding to events as they happen. Timing matters. So, okay, AIXI is a theoretical toy. How plausible are smarter systems in terms of something that someone might actually create in the real physical world? So it seems to me that when you consider how humans are made, they're actually, it's actually pretty plausible. So humans were made by evolution, right? Our, ev our intelligence comes from a slow, blind process of evolutionary trial and error, with kludge layered on kludge layered on kludge. On our particular branch of the tree of life, evolution ended up slowly, blindly increasing intelligence. So how far did it increase intelligence? It increased intelligence just far enough that maybe 100,000 years ago, our ancestors were able to close the loop and make culture. And after that, evolution couldn't make us any smarter because it didn't have time. Culture took over and it acted on a faster time scale. So humans are right on the cusp of general intelligence. Able, after tens or hundreds of thousands of years of accumulated group cultural evolution, to understand slowly and with difficulty evolution and the other processes that make our minds work. And then to begin to hack at these processes to make our minds work better. And that means that if by generally intelligent we mean beings able to build culture and tools or otherwise gradually improve their collective software, there's reason to believe that humans are about the stupidest a system can be if it is to be generally intelligent. Okay, so back from our segue, what kind of change might an actually powerful super intelli intelligence create, right? Um, so as for the details, we don't know, but probably deep change. Change that accesses possibilities far from those present and that really uses all the capacity in this here matter to serve some goal. And I have images here of three standard visualizations of what that might mean. First visualization, molecular nanotechnology. Precise control of matter at the atomic level. So instead of sort of slopping things together, you have each molecule carefully designed. Second visualization, computronium. The idea here is to figure out what the most efficient computer you can make out of a given area is, given planet size area maybe. Um, and then use all that computational power and all that enabled intelligence to effectively optimize for one's goal. And the quantities people believe to be physically possible are really quite large here. Um, and then light speed expansion, moving outward to grab all the resources you can to put toward your goal. Um, so a key point for why we saw all of that transformation from humans and why we expect that if we had more powerful intelligences, we'd see more transformation from them, is fungible resources. Resources that can be used for one function or for another function, but not both. So there is, as far as we know, a finite amount of usable energy, of matter, of space and time that we can reach. And if we build computation, there's a finite matter, amount in that of memory and C CPU cycles. And any atoms that you let alone are atoms you can't use to further your own goals. So transforming the world on this scale isn't about muscle. Um, it's about intelligence or optimization leverage. So you've got tiny human muscles can lead to big cranes and big power. And tiny AI muscles, such as even the ability to control pixels on a computer screen, um, can lead, sorry, can rapidly give the AI access to bigger muscles, which can then be combined with the same intelligence to grow bigger brains and muscles still. And if you don't believe me, you know, think about the things that your friends and boy, that your friends, girlfriends and boyfriends are able to persuade them to do, right? Um, <laughs> so you might be able to design a computer system that isn't hackable, but humans are hackable. 
Humans are messy systems. Give a smart enough AI access to a, hum to a screen that a human can see, and that AI can access human arms and legs, arms and legs that it can use to get plugged into the internet, access more human arms and legs, and eventually build technological manipulators that make us humans obsolete. Um, so again, why expect an intelligence explosion? One reason is that past a certain point, many intelligence's best options will be to build more intelligence. Intelligence that they can then use to pursue their goals, whatever their goals are. So, for most long-term goals that this child might have, if he wants to be a chemist or a doctor or a third world aid worker, his best strategy for now is going to involve things like getting enough sleep, getting a good education, and building up a good social network. Because whatever his goal ultimately is, he's going to want to have sort of general capabilities and resources to serve that goal. Um, and the argument is that past, similarly past a certain point, it looks as though, it turns out that most long-term goals are best realized by building a more intelligent system that can really figure out how to hit those goals. So for most long-term goals, this child should build a super intelligence that shares his goals. Um, and because of this usefulness, an intelligence explosion once started may be very sudden, with smart deciding to create smarter, deciding to create still smarter and the world eventually changing on scales faster than we humans can think. So, which is why the, as for the time to think about shaping the intelligence explosion is now. I'll say more about this in a moment. So, notice again that I've, so notice that as promised, this argument is very general. We're not relying on accelerating change or on Moore's law or any specific scenario. We're talking about what artificial intelligence may be like when we get there, for any of a broad set of ways of getting there. Claim two, an intelligence explosion may be sudden. Different phenomena occur on different characteristic time scales. Water droplets change in seconds, humans think so continents change over hundreds of millions of years. Humans think in minutes. Galaxies collide in billions of years. And atomic bombs explode in under a microsecond. The time scale on which we humans think is one possibility among many. And there's reason to believe that artificial intelligence might usher in a different, faster time scale. So one reason such a speed up is plausible is that, as noted, we've seen similar speedups before. Evolution takes millions of years to make its changes, but, cultural, but the cultural processes that evolution enabled in humans have been creating change on a scale of mere thousands of years, and lately even less. Also, different types of mental hardware work at different speeds. So neurons can fire in five milliseconds, and the faster, fastest transitions fired about a million times that pace. Okay, so how fast could human, brain, could human brain emulations run? There's actually a wide dispute here. I couldn't find a specific figure. Neuroscientists give a few orders of magnitude, and then it also depends how fast the computers are running at the time when human brain emulation becomes possible, if it becomes possible. But if you, could have a, if you did have a human brain emulation running, and most people think you can, then you could, if you had five times the hardware, probably get it to run at five times the speed. So there wouldn't be a single fixed pace for thought anymore. And there's no way that emulating these meaty human brains with their accidental spaghetti code is remotely close to the fastest way to be intelligent, right? So there's no question that the smartest conceivable minds could think at speeds we can't imagine or respond to, could operate at a faster time scale than we do. But the real question, of course, isn't how fast artificial intelligences could think once created. It's how fast AIs could arise, how fast the process of AI development could occur, and how much warning we humans would have. So let's talk about that. So as noted earlier, 
it looks as though past a certain point, engineering intelligence is actually the fast, most efficient route toward most systems goals. And if that's true, and if systems notice that, we might see a sudden surge in AI research. Even if we don't, my colleague Steve Rayhawk likes to call digital intelligence instant intelligence, just to add software. So Steve's point is that software can be copied. Making the first digital intelligence is hard, but once you have that intelligence, making the second, third, and da 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 10,000th digital intelligence is just copying software. So the impact of such copying depends on how, much resor how resource intensive the software is. If the first software requires a million dollars a day of CPU to run, copying will be limited by what we call a hardware bottleneck. On the other hand, if the first intelligent software can run on an ordinary human computer, say because AI is not very hardware intensive, then we could have billions of copies. <laughs> Literally, because there's billions of home computers, right? And these artificial intelligences could work in the economy and funnel money back into AI research, or could do AI research directly. Um, also, meat is a slow and messy business. <laughs> so we've got brain surgery and psychiatric drugs, but they're imprecise, and while we can create or copy humans, the process takes 20 years and a lot of labor, and it often produces unexpected results. But if we had digital access to a given mind, we could potentially try and test changes to that mind in minutes. We could try many variations, as evolution does, but in minutes instead of decades and with more strategy. And we could figure out which variants were best at math, which variants were best at earning money in the economy by various money or earning jobs, which variants were best at further software redesign, and then we could do the just add hardware thing, copy those across the hardware base. Hand-directed digital evolution. And then, of course, there's feedback. The smarter you are, or the smarter the consortium of AIs is, the more smarts it has to build further intelligence. So, AI doesn't need to, build, to move on the time scale we're used to. There's a broad range of different time scales on which processes can occur. And in particular, there's reason to believe that the process might be fast. That just as the transition from evolution to culture brought a speed up in time scales, so also the transition from fixed human brains to rapidly editable digital minds may bring a second speed up in time scales. And note again that the argument is very general. We're talking about dynamics and properties that hold across a broad range of ways that AI might occur. Claim three, an uncontrolled intelligence explosion would kill us and destroy practically everything we care about. So as discussed earlier, more, most powerful intelligences will radically rearrange their surroundings. And they'll radically rearrange their surroundings not because they value change as such, but because they're aimed at some goals or other. And the current arrangement of matter that happens to be present is not the best possible arrangement for suiting their goals. And they're smart enough to find and access better rearrangements. Um, now, that's bad news for us, right? Because most ways of rearranging our parts into some other configuration would kill us. And most ways of rearranging our environment would also kill us. But of course, the question isn't about most rearrangements. It's about most of the rearrangements that a broad swath of AIs might actually do. So you might ask, like, is there some reason why AIs would value us in particular and keep us intact through whatever rearrangements they're undertaking? Um, so some people suggest that AIs would value humans as trading partners. You've got sort of handcrafted crafts here, right, and handcrafted current manufactured goods also. <laughs> um, but the problem with this is that if you think about it, you'll find that most goals are better accessed, realized by some other use of your matter, your space, and your environment besides people-like use. So think about what you do with your Apple IIe. Sure, the Apple IIe has some use toward many different goals, but the metal inside it 
and the space it takes up on your desk have more use. I mean, and to make vivid the space of possibilities here, right, even if we somehow assume that the artificial intelligence wants trading partners, it seems unlikely that you are the most useful trading partner that a super intelligence could design with your resources. Okay, sometimes people suggest that AI would leave us alone the way we leave ants and bacteria alone. But remember again that we've left less and less alone as time has passed. And remember why we've left less and less alone. We've learned more and so we've been better able to find rearrangements that fit our goals. It seems very unlikely that a super intelligence, which is to say a being that's even smarter and more able to invent new possibilities than we are, right, would be unable to, use, to find a better use of our atoms, our food, and the air we breathe. Or again, sometimes people say, an AI will incorporate our ideas and our culture into its knowledge banks. And culture is what we really are anyhow, so we should be happy. The trouble with this is that your culture, too, can be scrapped and redesigned. Much as a competent computer programmer, taking over a job previously held by an unskilled high school intern might scrap the existing code base like so much obsolete spaghetti code. So consider how starkly vary values can vary across species. So we think fruit is yummy. Dung beetles think feces are yummy. Our tastes come from molecules and receptors, settings that can be arbitrarily set or reset as one designs intelligences. And it's no different on an abstract level. So we humans value entities that can enjoy life, that have experiences, especially rich experiences, that have curiosity and play and love. This content is tremendously important to us. That it's a set of complex, historically contingent perceptors and mechanisms and aims. We're no more likely to find intelligences who share our particular values than we are to find intelligences whose native language is English. And if we have an uncontrolled intelligence explosion, where our spaghetti code of culture gets scrapped and replaced by ideas that are actually efficient for an intelligence's goals, all this content, which we humans care so very much about, is likely to disappear. So note again that the arguments here are very general. <laughs> They apply to any sufficiently powerful entity whose goals aren't specifically, carefully rigged to be maximally fulfilled by our existence. Practically any powerful intelligence that isn't specifically designed not to is likely to destroy us incidentally in the course of fulfilling its own goals. Um, so claim four a controlled intelligence explosion could save us and protect practically everything else we care about. It's difficult, but worth the attempt. So remember again that artificial intelligences are like non-starfish. There's a huge space of possible minds, possible goals, possible machines. We can't control an intelligence explosion once unleashed. It's too fast and too powerful, like trying to control an atomic bomb in the middle of its explosion. But we can, if we think now, control the type of intelligence explosion that we unleash in the first place. The most possible minds would be far too chaotic for us to predict, but to build a controlled intelligence explosion, you don't need to predict all possible minds any more than a bridge builder needs to predict all possible physical systems. We just need to design one mind that we can predict and that will reliably do what we want. Um, yes, sorry. Yes, sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, that, sorry. I pushed the wrong button. Um, And note that designing an AI to have a particular goal is not at all the same thing as keeping an AI in a cage. It's designing an AI that organically wants to achieve some goal X and that uses all its intelligence to strive toward goal X more effectively. So to see why this is stable, consider your own preferences. 
Right now, you hopefully don't want to kill people, right? And so if I had a pill here that would make you want to kill people, you hopefully avoid taking the pill, because if you took the pill, you might kill people, and you don't want to kill people. Okay, so you are freely, at least partially, stable in your goals. And an engineered intelligence, more intelligent, more predictable, less messy a system than you, could be designed to be freely, really permanently stable in its intelligences. Um, of course, if you do build a super intelligently human optimizer, you better be sure that you direct it toward the right goals, right? So images from folklore about sorcerers, apprentices. Um, it might seem that even if we get the goal right, the result is a sort of hell. A hell like in Huxley's Brave New World, where humans get frozen into a permanent, pleasant but permanently boring state of being. A loss of life's potential to change and explore. But the very fact that you can regret that image, and that you can think that that future represents loss, means that the hell you're imagining is not what you'd get from something that actually optimized for your goals. Because if rich open-endedness is part of what we value, then rich open-endedness is part of what an intelligence that was actually optimizing for your values would create a lot of. And of course, if, we, um, if part of what we value is avoiding human extinction, then if we manage to have a controlled intelligence explosion, it would take care of all those other human extinction risks. So the 6.7 billion life question the current state is unstable. We've got change happening at a scale that's histor unprecedented compared to evolutionary scales. All kinds of things in flux. You can imagine going from here to non-AI human extinction, to a stable state that halts science, um, to an uncontrolled intelligence explosion, to a controlled intelligence explosion. And trying to get from here to a controlled intelligence explosion is a tall order, um, possibly the hardest thing that we've ever done, but it's something we can make incremental progress toward. We can do work on moral psychology to try to understand what it is that we value. Theoretical computer science on models for predictable optimization. Human decision making, how to be really sure we're getting this right in a context where unlike bridge building or historical scientific context, you don't get take backs, you actually do have to get it right the first time. Um, and there's a lot of other avenues too, so if you want to talk about it, catch me at the break. Thanks.